Well, welcome back to Doctor in Forensics and this episode of Point Counterpoint. It's been a few weeks since we actually uploaded an installation to the segment, but we have been doing our homework because we have been tracking along with somebody who is one of our new top five, Dr. Don Boyce. This gentleman, I had the pleasure of getting to know him through ReformationCharlotte.org, and I'm struggling because I can't remember which video we did where I actually cited and read his article. I just feel so embarrassed I can't remember the the video. Uh, We've done 100 plus of them, so I'm still finding that. But I want to introduce you to Dr. Don Boyce before I uh, turn it over uh, to him. And also on the call with me, I'm not doing this alone, thank goodness, is Brother Kyle Fosberg up in Minnesota. So, Brother Kyle, how are you? I'm doing good. Very good. And how's the, how's the weather? You know, you always have to give me my Minnesota weather report. What's going on up there? Man, it's been real great. It's sunny, and I think it's in the 60s today, 50s, 60s. So, hey, in March, I'll take it. Okay. Hey, don't forget, don't forget your sunscreen. I know you're fair-skinned. I don't want you to get burned. <laughs> so. get burned. We'll get burned. All right. So our guest today, our guest today is Dr. Don Boyce. He's uh, born in West Virginia, and uh, Don has a, a, a great pedigree here. He entered the Moody Bible Institute after high school. He also continued his education at Tennessee Temple College, Emmanuel College, and Heritage Baptist University, where he earned his Ph.D. Um, he's a fiery evangelist, and uh, he also was elected to the Indiana House of Representatives. And thank you in advance for, uh, thank you for serving, uh, Dr. Boyce. Dr. Boyce has a wife um, and children. Actually, um, he married Ellen Husong in late 88. He had a wife who passed away. And he is with his four children, now married. All of them are in full-time Christian work. He has three daughters. Uh, his three daughters are, are Christian school teachers, and his son is a pastor. How about that? So one of the reasons why I like Dr. Don Boyd is his writing style is uh, one of revival. He really focuses on that. Um, we're all about restoring and repenting here on our channel, but he's, he delivers his writings with a lot of humor and a lot of history, and I found that out last week when I was on a phone call with him. Now, Dr. Don, uh, Dr. Don Boyes is a strong, fundamental Baptist preacher. Yes, we love fundamentalists. He believes the Word of God, which is, as we say here on the channel, if you have one thing you can ask of God, ask for godly character. Uh, that's the most important thing, and he believes the same. So, He's quite accomplished. Dr. Boyce in this ministry, he's written for national newspapers, USA Today, um, from 1985 through 93. He's also been featured in uh, the Chattanooga Free Press, the Sword of the Lord, the Baptist Tribune, and just a plethora of other magazines and newspapers, such as the Chicago, Chicago Tribune, the Los Angeles Times, Indianapolis News, Indianapolis Star, the Sacramento Bee, and the London Daily Mail. So the reason why he's on our show today is because he's controversial, but not to believers. He's been on talk show appearances, if you, appearances, if you remember these shows. I do. I grew up watching these shows, Sally, Jesse, Raphael, the Jerry Springer show three times. you got to tell us about that. The Wharton Downey <laughs> Jr. show. I, I remember that show. I watched that show, NBC News Nightly, CBS Morning News, the Christian Television Network three times. The Jack Anderson Show, the Pat Buchanan Show, uh, the London BBC and ABC Radio Network. So after saying all of that, good afternoon, Dr. Don Boyce, and thank you for joining us here on Point Counterpoint. Good afternoon. It is a joy. I'd like to be with you all. I've been looking forward to it. Well, we've been excited about it because Dr. Boyce picked my brain, and I did something that was so out of character, I actually – picked the uh, uh stop being a keyboard warrior and asked to ask if he would be willing to discuss an article that was posted a few weeks back on uh, March 12th at uh Reformation Charlotte uh .org Dr. Boyes wrote an article right uh at the time that Beth Moore left well the article says Beth Moore leaving the FBC was the right decision 
but for the wrong reason. And I read the article, and I agree with everything that he said in, in there. But in our pursuit of truth, one of the things that we try to do is give people enough contextual reasons why, why, we, say such th- why we say such things and why you would say such a thing. And so when we met last week on the phone, you gave us a great historical background of the SBC from a historical standpoint. And so your concerns are our concerns. So I would open up and say, you know, at the top, what would be your biggest concern, Dr. Boyce, about what you're seeing right now in the SBC? Oh, well, of course, it would be, it would be multiple, really. I don't know if I can categorize them in quantify them. Uh, the, the, the colleges and seminaries have gone bad, uh, and as the colleges and seminaries go, so goes the pulpits. And uh, by going bad, I mean uh, they, uh, uh, they're not, they put more emphasis in, on, on education than it, it, evangelism. Uh, they, they were not willing to come out and, uh, and boldly say they believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. Uh, they dance all around that. Uh, uh, so the, the colleges and seminaries are, are in bad shape. Of course, they lost some of their colleges. The, the traditionally Baptist colleges are really no longer Baptist, uh, Baylor, uh, Mercer, et cetera. They're, they're, but, and even the seminaries, uh, uh, there was a resurgence back a couple of decades ago. Uh, fundamentalists took over, and uh, that is now a thing of the past. So when, when the colleges and seminaries go in a denomination, it, it, it can't stand because the, the, the graduates come out corrupted and uh, don't believe uh, the way daddy and granddaddy believed. And, uh, uh, but, but the specific problems I see uh, in the Southern Baptist Convention, and it's true, and I guess, in some of the others, uh, would be the... the uh, Emphasis the uh, excessive uh, racial racial fanatics that have taken over, or at least are taking over, uh, and uh, this is difficult to deal with because nobody wants to endorse racism, uh, and, and 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 it seems like now in the last few years everything is racism. I mean, uh, I, I understand that uh, two plus two equals four literally is racism. That, that, that's so silly. I can't believe any intelligent person would believe that, but uh, all this is coming out of the, uh, the universities. And um, so we, uh, there, there are a number of men in the Southern Baptist Convention, and they've, been, they've had a lot of growth, by the way, among the uh, among uh, black uh, churches and Hispanic churches. And mm-hmm. some of the black churches will hold uh, uh, membership also uh, in not only the Southern Baptist, but the National Baptist Convention. And uh, uh, but some of these guys, uh, and they're not. By the way, they're not. They're not uh, uh, slouches. I mean, some of them are, are well-educated men, and uh, but but they they defend extreme uh, uh, Black Lives Matter. You know, when I first mm-hmm. heard that, I thought, well, of course, Black Lives Matter. I, right. Uh, I said, I remember when I first heard this. That's a good statement. Black Lives Matter. I said, well, everybody's life matters, of course. And uh, uh, but then it became not just Black Lives Matter, but it became a, a movement and then an organization, and worth many, many millions of dollars. By the way, for some of the left wing uh, organizations that uh, yes. are p- pumping money into it, but I-, I can't imagine that being an issue. And that they they're saying, well, sure, Black Lives Matter, and and but then when we insist on all lives matter, that that somehow indicates white supremacy or or uh, uh, being anti-black. This, this is so silly. Uh, I find it amazing that intelligent people uh, are arguing about it. But it's a big deal in the Southern Baptist Convention. And, uh, the, the, and some of these pastors uh, of the black churches have large churches, and, uh, but also they have a large bank account, and money talks. And uh, uh, just recently, in the last few months, a couple of months, uh, a black pastor in Texas has pulled out of the Texas Southern Baptist uh, Convention and, it, and may pull out of the Southern Baptist Convention if he doesn't like what, what happens at the next uh, national convention. So the SBC has a major problem with uh, what I call race, race, racial fanatics. Uh, 
they have a problem with Reformed theology. And, uh, uh, and, and I, I have no problem with the with, uh, sovereignty of God. And, uh, in fact, I would, be call, I would call myself a, um, a Charles Spurgeon uh, Calvinist. I don't like to use the term Calvinist, but uh, uh, I'm sure not an Arminian. But uh, mm-hmm. I think they've gone to extremes on this, and it's, it's causing disruption. Uh, some of these old-time Baptists, uh, and uh, that only God knows where that's going to go and, and how detrimental it is. Uh, they have a major problem with women preachers and women leaders, uh, and some of them have gone even uh, to the extreme of, I think, feminism. And, right. uh, uh, and, this, and one black pastor, uh, McKissick, uh, from Texas, had said that he would, he would nominate uh, Beth Moore, of course, that was before she resigned and left, but he would resign her, uh, he would uh, nominate her if he thought she would take the, the position as president of the SBC. You see, that, right. especially with me and my annoying, the Southern Baptist Convention have preached to many of their churches and in some of their biggest churches, the smallest churches, family members there and all. I, I, that's astounding that, that, that yes. you considered. And so let me unpack a little bit here, um, because I made some notes as you were traveling along the road, and and then I'm going to yield to Kyle to get his thoughts here. But I, I just wanted to say, I think that you see what we see, and racism has become an industry. I mean, it's it's yep. a business of of money changers, and I think it's very interesting. You mentioned Black Lives Matter. When I first heard the slogan "Back Black Lives Matter," whenever I heard it, I laughed because I, I agree with you. All lives matter. But being the sleuth that I am, I actually went to their website two years ago just to read what these people were purporting. And since I know that this information can get scrubbed, I actually made a copy of their website and downloaded all of the content. Because, you know, the media, every time, every now and again, they want to cover up people's track. But what was really glaring during the 2018 midterms, I went to their website and I was fictitiously acting as if I was going to make a donation, and their website took me to a website called actblue.com. Yes. yes. Com- completely separated. I'm like, oh, wow, where am, I, where am I now? So in researching that website, all the money that was being given to Black Lives Matter was being funneled through Act Blue and was going to all of the candidates that were running for offices for the midterms. Now, that would be yeah. a problem. And if anybody cares about righteousness at all, this is a massive marketing uh, Ponzi scheme meant to simply funnel money to Democratic, Marxists, and all the other God-haters out there to keep them in political power. And that's not just an opinion. That's a fact. Yes, that's exactly right. You're you're right on everything you said. (laughs) Yeah, so it's 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 quite it's quite telling if you follow the narratives, and we do follow the narratives. What 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 say you, brother Kyle? Uh-huh. Well, I'll just introduce myself briefly and just kind of give a context to uh, some of my history and background. Um, I am from the Minneapolis area, and I first um, became acquainted with, I would say, sound doctrine, sound Bible teaching through uh, John MacArthur, and then I became acquainted. Uh, um, with uh, John Piper, because he he was the pastor here in my my city, and just to give sort of a um, a context to you know how you know my background and how I see race and this Black Lives Matter thing playing into all this, I will just say I remember back when Trayvon Martin was killed, and there could have been some uh, news stories prior to that, but that's the one I remember being the first to really start this snowball effect of uh, what has morphed into this woke Black Lives Matter culture and what has um, hijacked the church um, in recent years. And I went to the Desiring God Ministries website way back when Trayvon Martin had been killed. And I remember seeing on the, the front page a picture of Trayvon Martin, and the article title was Race and the Christian. And I remember just, I didn't, read the article, at least I don't think I did. Obviously, it didn't have an impact on me, if I don't remember it, but I remember the title, and I remember just getting a funny feeling, because back in those days, I I listened to John Piper a lot, because 
I mean, he was a very intelligent guy. I mean, he was a gifted man. He was a gifted man. And um, I really liked his sermons. And when I went to Desiring God, I wanted to hear a good sermon. I didn't want to hear about racism, <laughs> you know, unless it's a personal story in which it ties into something. But I just got a funny feeling when I saw that. And that was many years ago now. But that was the very mm -hmm. beginning. And since then, I, I've pretty much completely disengaged from really anything uh, Christian as far as like a church or a ministry other than um, Doctor and Forensics and my friend's friendship with uh, Sean and the crew. But since then, John Piper has really uh, just taken a fall. And I'm just, I'm, I'm watching kind of from the sidelines in awe because he's, he, he was such a strong, steadfast man. And I would have never... Um, I would have never thought that he'd be saying some of the things that he's saying. I mean, there, after I saw that article, I, I kind of, like I said, disengaged, but I still thought this man is, is so strong and there's no way he's going to fall. And I've been seeing some of the things that he said and I'm just sitting back. And so my question to you, Don, is do you think, do you see this as judgment beginning first at the house of God? Do you see what, what, what's happening in the church as God's judgment upon the church? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and I'm with you on the thing of John Piper. I, I've been shocked uh, at some of the things he said, positions he's taken. And, and I, 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 I'm just shocked. That's the only thing I can say. Uh, I don't know where in the world it's going to end up. But uh, uh, there, there's no question that, uh, that, that many, and he and some others have led younger men uh, I think astray. Uh, you know, I, I'm quite simple. I, I simply believe that that, uh, that the, the Bible is quite clear. You need to trust Christ as personal Savior. You need to join a Bible preaching church. You need to live, live a godly life. You need to tithe. You need to talk to to people about Christ. You need to to live what you talk, and uh, and uh, uh, treat everybody the same. Uh, you know, to try to be fair with people. Pay your bills. Uh, I, I don't believe in this Christianity where uh, it, 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 it doesn't change your life. The Bible clearly teaches that if you know Christ as Savior, you're a different person. There's a change that mm -hmm. comes about in your life. And I make the statement there's no change, there's no conversion. But I'm seeing today even preachers who, who believe cursing is totally normal. They, they can defend homosexuality. They defend uh, immorality, uh, fornication. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's surprising, shocking. And I wonder where we're headed, and not just the Southern Baptist group, but but all the but known as evangelical groups. Yeah, it's it's uh, quite nerve wracking. Um, but I always go back to what the scripture says, and and this is going to sound brutal, but it's the scripture. You know, the word says that they were with us, but they weren't. They they were among us, but they weren't with us. And when That's you exactly ponder right. the words of Jesus, when you ponder the word of Jesus, it's like there's a lot of people out there that are posing as Christians and believers. And let's just be candid here. The money is so good. We have nothing but money changers. It seems like 90% of pastors' ministries and so-called outreach ministries are exchanging money. And it's, it's the, 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 the whole structure of how they set up is not to actually save a soul. It's to do these, quote, unquote, works that they think that God's going to be pleased with. I always talk about on our channel a lot. Our ministry is one person at a time. God did not send us to Madagascar. Now, does Madagascar need to be evangelized? Absolutely. But if we go back to Acts, as we should, it's house to house, it's door to door, it's person to person. So the whole construct of church here in the 19th and the 20th century, in my mindset, from my studies, is absolutely backwards. And I look at the SBC as a whole and all the large Baptist churches and mega churches and I don't think God cares for the construct of the church in, Western, uh, in the Western culture at all. And I definitely see that every single day the SBC is doing everything they can to run everything they're doing straight off into the pit of hell. They're really good at it. I, I, I think they enjoy yeah. it. Or maybe that's just my sarcasm. Well, you know, we, we look at where we are today. And and when we and as I said in my life, I, I, by the time I can see some massive changes uh, over the decades, but but going all the way back to the original churches, 
Um, mm-hmm. the, the, the first century church, uh, it was, they, they were known for simplicity. They were simple. They, they were separated. People knew they were, they, they were called Christians because they reminded people of Christ. They were separated uh, in the way they lived and talked. And uh, also they were scriptural. It, it was a, it, uh, they were, the services were teaching and preaching of the Word of God. Uh, uh, simple uh, uh, hymns and gospel songs. Uh, and uh, uh, today, we, we the especially some, you know, some of the a few of the mega churches are are still preaching the word, but too often uh, we look at success uh, and it, 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 it's the cash and the crowds and the converts, but that's not necessarily the sign of a successful church. And uh, right. there may be cash, and there may be crowds, and there may be co- converts, uh, but uh, I think if the, if, if it's real converts that it's going to show in godly living and we, we but there's some people tell us that that we're right in, in the midst of a great revival this is silly i, I know about great revivals in, in, the, in the last uh, two thousand years and when there's a, when the great when there's great revivals it changes people's lives it closes saloons and it, it eliminates prostitution for at least for a, a, a few a while uh the ch- child abuse stops etc it, it, it impacts society not just the churches and we're not in the midst of a revival. I, I would love to see another revival, but uh, I, I, I disagree with the people who, who say that we're there today. We're sure not in a revival. I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be totally honest. When I listen to local faith radio here where I live, um, there's a lot of good content on there. I would I would say it falls under the category of sound doctrine, but there's a problem with it. And I couldn't really put my finger on it. I knew what it was in my soul, but I couldn't articulate it. What, what do I really dislike about everything that I'm hearing on here, or, or not hearing, rather? And I'll get to that in a yeah. second. But as I was listening to these programs, um, one of the, the, um, the hosts to, for a program, uh, she said that she would just kind of talk, and she's like, you know, with all the, the drifting going on out there in the church. And I remember thinking, it's not drifting. It's apostasy. I want to yes. hear them come on the air and say the word apostasy, and I've never heard them say it. Now, while I'm at it, while I'm at my rant here, <laughs> I want to say it really bugs me how I can't think of a single guest who's ever been on who was not selling a book. Now, am I going to judge anybody selling a book? Not necessarily, but wouldn't it be great if we had a construct that you could actually have a voice without selling something? That would really be refreshing, but it's just not the way things are set up now. And to a certain extent, I understand that because, you know, it costs money to run television programs and radio programs right, and things. Yeah. But it's a combination of these two, these two ideas that they're always selling something. It's always go buy this person's book. This person has a book. Oh, it's a must read. It's a must read. Well, I think the Bible is a must read. So let's just, <laughs> let's just send everyone to the Bible and then... Let's, um, let's use the word apostasy because that's actually what's going on. Yeah, there is drifting going on too, but that's not the core problem. The core problem is we have a falling away. That's what the Bible says. Right. That's, yes. that's right. So, yes. I certainly agree with that. It's a, a very I, frustrating thing because, you know, I hear a lot of uh, content in that, that radio program that, you know, I would, I would like to share it. I would like to get on board. I'd like to be excited about it. But there's always this, this uh, overriding um, feeling over me that just says, you know, it's just a feeling of just disappointment that why can't, why can't we just tell the truth and be honest about the state of things and stop pretending um, through what we say or what we don't say that there's going to be some um, – awakening going on in the, the younger generations. The younger generations are completely lost. They're completely and utterly lost. They have no grounding. They have no most of them are just thrown into the public schooling system like like animals in a cage and they're they're, you know, convinced that you have to go to college and get a degree uh, because that's just what you do and and it's just it's very sad. And you see this um in the suburbs where I live and in the inner cities and things and I think we've just gotten so far away from from the truth, and we've been sold so many lies that you know we, it's like we're we're trying to climb out of the hole that we dug ourselves into as a society. Yeah, right. 
Well, you know, I'm going to slide in here and just read a passage of Scripture, and let's see if this sounds like 2021. I'm going to read the passage, then I'm going to tell you where it's from, but you guys know it. It says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious, gossip, without control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, such men, excuse me, avoid such men as these. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sin, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come into the knowledge of the truth. That's uh, 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 all the way down through 8. And so when we wrap up this conversation to talk about what are we talking about, we're talking exactly what Paul told Timothy. And it's startling because it's real because people who call themselves a Christian are displaying the same behaviors that we're not supposed to. So the question is, are they really Christians? And I'm going to be bold enough to say they're not. I agree. Yes, I agree. Now, we can't, it's, we can't make a judgment about each individual, uh, mm-hmm. but, but, but we can say generally, uh, as I said earlier, if there's no change, there's no conversion. I got saved at 15, and it turned me upside down. I mean, all my habits, my, my life, the people I ran with, uh, friends, uh, what I did on Sunday, what I did on other days of the week, how I used my money. I mean, as a 15-year-old, it turned me upside down. So that's all wow. I know. It happened to me. And, uh, and, and in the Scripture, I see when people get saved, uh, they are, they're different. They're changed. And, uh, mm. But today, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's so shallow. And, uh, and apostasy is a good word. We're, we're into the apostasy, in my opinion. We are. I, yeah. I, I want to segue here to say, um, just for your consideration, we've got J.D. Greer, who is the ahead of today's SBC. We started there, and let's circle back to that. Here are four or five headlines. These are just headlines of the behavior that he has, and this just startled everybody. Here's one headline. J.D. Greer mocks God's design for women, says that they should take spiritual authority, and that's number one. Second headline. J.D. Greer defends staff member who had gay hookups online and looked at gay pornography. That's headline number two. Yeah, that that, that should make any Baptist and anybody fall out of their chair. I hadn't read that. That's that's amazing. That's that's astounding, in fact. I knew he had problems, but that's, that's, that's shocking. Yeah, and again, this is not throw J.D. Greer on the bus day, but the problem is why does he keep coming up in the conversation and none of it is biblical, none of it is holy, none of it gives any glory to God. So two more. J.D. Greer says Jesus doesn't tell us to obey his moral law. And then last one, J.D. Greer says that he'd rather unite with those who pervert the gospel than those who defend it. So... If you are a part of the SBC and this is the vial that's coming across the pulpit, the question is, why are you still there if you call yourself a true Bible-believing Christian? Sometimes you have to grab your Bible, no matter what version you have, and walk out the back door. We are giving you permission to walk out the door. I'll yield. And and don't look back or you'll turn into a pillar of salt. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. Exactly, exactly. So I yield to either one. Um, well, you know, uh, the Bible uh, tells us that the... Go ahead, go ahead. No, I think that's an excellent statement. I'm, I'm shocked about Greer. I hadn't read them. I, I try to stay up on the news, but uh, that is, that's amazing. Uh, you, you know, I, I think that sometimes some of the things that preachers say, uh, of course, preachers have not been known to, uh, to admit their, their, their faults very often. You know that. It's, it's so easy to uh, uh, to preach one thing and practice another, and uh, mm-hmm. and I know that I've seen this even among independent Baptist pre- preachers that I've known for for decades. Uh, but uh, we all we all have that tendency. 
we, we can see that we can see the problems in other people and other families, but right. not in their own. But uh, no, I, I I can't imagine why some of the Southern Baptists I know are still in the Southern Baptist Convention. First of all, you know I would even be a member of any kind of denomination, the best. Uh, because it's not found in the scripture. I think all churches are supposed to be right. totally independent. Yes, I agree with that. Amen. Somebody actually thinks how I think I'm not the weird one. I, I, I say that all the time. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus created his church. He didn't create a denomination. Now, Satan right. created denominations, and we actually did a good job with helping him. I have, when people talk about they're a part of a certain denomination, I get it. But at the end of the day, I read the book of Acts and the epistles, and I realize what Jesus did and what the disciples were assigned to do has nothing to do with these sibling, sibling children of the Catholic Church. And that's what they are. And that's another topic. Yeah. We won't go there. But you don't yeah. get me started about all the sibling reprobate churches that the Catholic Church has spawned. It just makes me nauseous. Yeah, right. I agree. Yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of it is carry over from Catholicism, Roman Catholicism. But we really shouldn't be surprised by this, uh, Brother Sean and uh, Dr. Don, because when we read in the Bible that love of money is the root of all evil, I look at these institutions and there's just too much money there. There's, there's too much money in all of this for it to not be corrupted. And, you know, you'll hear justification saying, well, you know, God has blessed us or, you know, we're allowed to make a living and all this. But it's so far beyond that. I mean, there was a time in our history where you could maybe justify having a Bible college because people needed to be educated. There, there weren't um, readily available materials and the word was still spreading. And But today, uh, these are just uh, for-profit businesses. I mean, that's the way I see yes. it. And it has, it has nothing to do with what we read in Acts. I mean, none of this. It's all just, it's like man, had, you, you take a Bible, and then you just, you're just dumping dirt over the top of it, covering it up. All, all you need is the Bible and Jesus. I mean, just open it up, you know, the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus, you know? But we've turned it into to for-profit businesses, and it is wicked. It is bad. Well, you know, Brother Kyle, it, it's actually a real interesting math problem. So I think some of the listeners know that I used to attend Lakewood Church 10, 12 years ago, a lot of years ago. So let's say on any average weekend, that facility, which I remember, can hold about 42,000 people. So 42,000 people and the average person gives $20, so let's multiply by 20. That's $840,000. That's on the low end. So let's times that by 52 weeks. $43 million. $43 million. That's on the low end, gentlemen. That's on the low end. We're not talking about books. We're not talking about CDs. We're not talking about the conferences. We're not talking about the merch. We're not talking about the caps and, you know, the, the book dividers and all the other paraphernalia that goes on in these bookstores. But that's $43 million of the average person on a weekly basis giving $20. So you're absolutely over the target, Brother Kyle. It's about money, and it all has seeped into what, sh what should be institutions that are fighting against the culture, Black Lives Matter, the Marxist movement, all the race baiting and the race hustlers are out there. We should be so far separated from the world that we actually are hated by the world. The problem that I see is that we look just like the world, not we as in us three, but the church as a whole, you cannot distinguish the difference between them and the world. That is a problem. That's a big problem. That's exactly right. You rang the bell. Just, I mean, just there terrible. are so many things we could say right now. I mean, I feel like, I feel like there are so many directions we can take because it's um, – I'll, I'll uh, yield to Don. <laughs> <laughs> so, Don, let me ask you a question because we're, we're coming up on our mark, but we're going to have a nice – because we can go on forever, and I, I want to be mindful of your time. Past, present, future. Don is obviously a little older than Brother Kyle and I. Um, Brother Don, I got five decades behind me. Brother Kyle has what, three? Three, yeah. Uh, three. So – this whole narrative of where the Southern Baptists 
and the Southern Baptist Convention has come from. I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church. Um, I had a hellfire and brimstone pastor, and people taught ministers like that. But I tell you one thing, when I was living unrighteous, those sermons would come up in my heart as I was doing unrighteous things because the Bible says, right, right. you know, you know, train up a child in the way it should go. And when they get old, right. they won't depart from it. Well, thank God for Pastor Carr, who week yeah. in and week out preached the same message about the salvation of Jesus Christ every single Sunday. From age 7 to 15, that man preached a gospel message. You couldn't pay somebody to preach a gospel message. Not today. And I see that's where the biggest vacuum is, is at some point when the world gets really calamitous, because I think we're on a tipping point here, is they're going to be looking for people to tell them the truth. And I fear for all the mega pastors and preachers and all the feel-good cotton candy ministers out there, they're going to be, people are going to be looking for them. It's not going to end well for them. Um, their money's right. not going to keep them protected. Uh, people are going to be out. There will be, as they say, there will be blood in the water, and the sharks will be hunting. So I'll yield, Dr. Don. Yeah, I think you're right. You did a better job than I do. Uh, you're exactly right. And uh, we, we're going to see uh, if, if it keeps continuing, then, and we don't have any reason to know why it won't, uh, it get, as the Bible teaches, things will get worse and worse and worse. How much worse can they get? Uh, other than maybe uh, uh, massive persecution and opposition from those who are trying to live right, uh, but uh, a revolution in the streets, which I think we're going to see. I think in our lifetime soon we're going to see not just a little uh, what they call a little insurrection like in Washington D.C., but but massive mm-hmm. uh, protests and, and rebellion, revolution. So we, yes. we we're living in strange days, unusual days. I come back to. Uh what Don said earlier in the call, because I think that uh, we need to we need to reference that again. And I pulled up Romans six fifteen through sixteen. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So think of that. Whether sin unto death. So sin is death or obedience unto righteousness. Now, you tell me that we're not to obey Jesus. If, if there's a preacher out there who says that, oh, it's, it's not important, you know, what the, you know, how you live your life after you're saved, as if it's, uh, oh, I'm saved today, and then now I'm free to go do whatever I want, or this easy believism nonsense. The whole point, well, the, Satan has literally convinced uh, a, a large segment of professing believers that, obedience is not even important. He's literally convinced them that. I mean, it's gotten to the point. It's so utterly ridiculous to me. Um, and all, all we have to do is go back and read the Bible. Read the Bible. Read it for yourself. Don't believe something someone's telling you because they look the part or they seem knowledgeable or they're ordained or whatever else. That doesn't mean anything. And that should be especially clear in this day and time that there's – you, you can't trust anybody. You've got to go to the Word. You've got to read it. Uh, the whole point of salvation is to live according to God's will, be obedient. That's the whole point. Amen. Yes, that's exactly Amen. right. Uh, uh, Sean, let me, uh, let me let people know where they can read some of my columns. Uh, I write one yes. or two columns every yes, week. Yes, please. And uh, my blog is uh, Don Boy's. That's D O N B as in boys, uh, B O Y S, just like boys and girls. Don Boys dot C S T News dot com. That C S T stands for Common Sense Today. So it's Don Boys dot C S T News dot com. That's my blog, and I've got hundreds of of articles on all kinds of controversial subjects. Unbelievable, uh, as far as the the, uh, the variety. And uh, and uh, also my website is cstnews.com. It's not as up-to-date. In fact, it's supposed to be put, be put up-to-date right now. But cstnews.com, uh, a lot of my earlier articles and a couple of uh, sermons, lectures, a debate at one of the universities, I think. Anyway, I think it'll, it'll keep the interest of anybody and give a lot of information. 
I appreciate that. And I was definitely going to I was definitely going to close with that. And uh, Dr. Don also is an author. He has three books. One's called The Muslim Invasion. The Fuse is Burning. And then one's called Evolution, Fact, Fraud, or Faith. And then the one I think is a powerful title, uh, The God Haters. And I think all of those are probably phenomenal reads. I, I can't wait to read them myself. Uh, and, and I want to say this for our audience, too, because we, we love promoting godly people. Um, Dr. Don is not a 501c3. So he and his efforts of his wife and family, they self-published, and, and all of this stuff uh, has come about because of the Lord and his own effort and his own, own dime. So I want to tell him thank you for that. We talked about that a week ago, just, just like, you know, the word says, freely we receive, freely we give. And I can appreciate his blog. And when you go there, uh, have some time and grab a coffee because there is an article on everything. So I, I, I can appreciate the time and the effort that you put into it, Dr. Don. Uh, I can tell it's a labor of, the, a labor of love, and I know the Lord's going to bless you back for all that you have done. Brother Kyle, you have anything to say in closing? Um, I, I don't. I think I said my piece, but I think the call was really great. It was great meeting you and talking with you. And, I mean, we need more of this in the church. We just need more honest conversation. Mm-hmm. Well, I fantastic. I'm, I'm glad to be with you, with you too. It's been a pleasure. Well, it won't, be, it won't be the last time, Dr. Don, and we'll definitely be. I'll let you know when we're citing your articles and some of your writings because, uh, as I mentioned to you, a lot of times we'll use great writers and articles to drag people into a Bible study, and you certainly have a writing style that makes it easy for us to do that. So we want to thank you again for, for joining us on this episode of Point Counterpoint, and that we will be in touch. And also, I'm going to put all of your contact information at the tail end of this video and in the, in the, in the show notes and the remarks so people can click straight to you from the bottom of the YouTube page. So I want to say thank oh, you great. to both you guys. Okay? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And our pleasure. And Brother Kyle, thank you for your time. You guys have a beautiful day. And God bless you all, you and your families. Thank you for listening to Dr. Forensics Point Counterpoint.